You're a wizard, Harry. But I'm just Harry. Well, just Harry, you're a wizard. To a whole generation of people, there was a single franchise that dominated the 2000s. You might have heard about it, kind of a niche series really, with an incredibly prominent book series selling over 500 million copies, leading to an equally successful film franchise. Harry Potter remains one of the most highly profitable media franchises of all time, with some sources estimating it to be worth roughly 30 billion pounds. In addition to it being the crown jewel of Warner Bros, the Harry Potter franchise is a series loved by an entire generation of people who grew up reading the books and watching the films and it's a powerful source of nostalgia for many people. Who could forget iconic scenes like, it's Leviosa, not Leviosa, or Why did you put your name in the cupboard of fire? Dumbledore asked calmly. Personally, I got into the franchise a bit later than most people, and I've always been a bit more interested in sci-fi than fantasy personally. That being said, I did really enjoy the Harry Potter series. I wouldn't go so far as to say it shaped who I am today. That probably goes towards another iconic British property. <clears throat> but it was a series that inspired so many children, teaching about tolerance and acceptance through the eyes of a main cast that everyone could relate to. An entire generation of people grew up with Harry Potter, and naturally there is quite a strong fan base around the title, with Warner Bros capitalizing on the success of the franchise through their Harry Potter experience, a lot of merchandise, and a dire pentalogy that only managed to get three of the five installments. The most recent addition to this lineup was for a video game. No, not that one. Hogwarts Legacy is the latest release from the Harry Potter license, and while I haven't played the game, from the footage I've seen, it looks very impressive. The combat system looks interesting, and there's a beauty in being able to explore a fully realized Hogwarts through a video game that you just don't get from a film where the focus is on someone else. Despite all that, the game has been mired by a rather vocal controversy that has clouded the release of Hogwarts Legacy, calling for a boycott of the game and the franchise as a whole. I should say now, this is going to be a bit different from my previous videos. It's going to be a little less focused on the game itself, and more looking at what's been going on around it, so bear that in mind. In this video, I want to take a look at the controversy of Hogwarts Legacy, to see what caused it, why it had such an impact, and the different groups connected, to look at what different people are saying, and see whether people should buy or boycott. Kinda pointless given the game's already out by the time this gets released, but hopefully it'll be interesting at least. I'm going to try and give a fair and balanced review of events covering different viewpoints, but I need to be clear that this isn't me approving those views. I will say now that I fundamentally disagree with JK Rowling and condemn the comments she has made, but I'm not trying to mock or label her. I'll be covering what she has said, how people have interpreted her words, as well as the impact they could have. But with that being said, I'm not the target of a lot of JK Rowling's comments. Most of my friends are LGBT, and some are non-binary or trans, but I'm cis and don't have the lived experience of a trans person, so all I can do is try and present things as responsibly as possible, while linking to trans creators who will be able to give a far more in-depth analysis than I could. I should also say that I'm not trying to point the finger at people who did or didn't buy Hogwarts Legacy. I'm not trying to shame people for playing the game, and I'm more interested in taking a look at the controversy itself. Before going any further, I need to put a trigger warning quickly. This video is going to be talking about transphobia, and will touch on transphobic talking points and statements. So if that is something you don't feel comfortable with, I'd recommend skipping this particular video. With that being said, Hi, I'm Banquo, and this is the controversy of Hogwarts Legacy. If you like what you've heard so far, maybe consider gently pressing the like button, and perhaps even subscribe. But without further delay, Let's jump right into it. In order to address the controversy that has plagued Hogwarts Legacy, the first step is to take a look at its origin, that being J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling is one of the most influential authors of all time, and given how involved she is with Harry Potter, her views are directly tied to the property she has created, not to mention the royalties she makes off of every product released, meaning she gets a cut of every sale of Harry Potter merchandise, something to keep in mind going forward. I am going to briefly cover quite a long history of controversy here, and while I am going to try and be as accurate as possible, I will be condensing a lot of it down, so if you want a more in-depth breakdown, I will link a number of videos down below. It started in 2018 with JK liking a tweet, 
referring to trans women as men in dresses. A pretty transphobic remark to endorse, but JK Rowling and her team have claimed that this was a slip-up, where JK accidentally liked the post while holding her phone, and given nobody was present to comment otherwise, I'm not going to use this as an argument for Rowling endorsing transphobic views. The reason I made note of it though is that it's linked to the start of the backlash that Rowling began to receive, with multiple people quite understandably questioning how could it have happened. There was also a vocal minority that left abusive comments, something I'll come back to a bit later. This was further compounded when JK followed someone with a profile page that directly referred to themselves as a transphobe. Well, I guess they were honest, is that a silver lining? This prompted a similar reaction to the previous incident. And while claims of transphobia were again disputed by Rowling and her team, there was another wave of backlash, like tremors before an earthquake, and the rumbling was coming. That was an Attack on Titan joke, but I can't even use the relevant footage, because I don't want to spoil it for anyone. But if you take something away from this moral deep dive into transphobia, boycotts, and Harry Potter, let it be to be kind to people for starters, but also go watch Attack on Titan. It's great. Anyway, the main claims of transphobia against Rowling came in 2019, where she posted support for Maya Forstater, a woman claiming she had lost her job by saying, as JK Rowling puts it, that sex is real. To add a bit of clarification on my part, sex is real is a statement referring to biological sex, or the sex you were assigned at birth, being real. Now, this is a pretty vague thing to say to begin with, but it also isn't anywhere close to how Maya actually worded things. I wonder why JK chose to word it like that. Oh. Oh, um, maybe that's why. Maya was referring to trans women as male people, disregarding gender identity entirely, gender identity being our personal sense of our own gender. And part of the reason for her dismissal was Maya refusing to use the correct pronouns for a colleague and was warned that she was creating a hostile workplace for employees. There's also this one, which I don't know about you, but I feel is going a bit further than saying sex is real. Just a bit. I'm not going to cover Maya too deeply here, because we do need to get to video games at some point. Some of the videos linked down below take a more in-depth look at what Maya had been saying, so if a deep dive within a deep dive sounds interesting, I'll leave links to some of those videos down below, which I may have heavily plagiarized here. I may have stolen that line from Hbomber Guy as well. But moving on. So JK tweeted out her support for Maya, but also that the only thing she had said was sex is real, quite different to what Maya had actually said. Also worth noting, this doesn't appear to be a defense of freedom of speech, based on something JK saw in passing and commented on. Because her comments aren't just voicing support, she's also heavily rephrasing what Maya said, into a statement that seems fairly innocuous to the average person. I mean, it's definitely a lot nicer than this. Based off of JK's tweet, we can infer that she's both familiar with Maya's situation, at least enough to rephrase Maya's statements, and is focusing on the fact her statements weren't a problem. Also know that she doesn't state forcing people out of their jobs, she talks about forcing women out, which is an important distinction that I'll come back to a bit later. I swear this is about video games, just bear with me for a bit. JK Rowling's wording of Maya's argument that sex is real isn't just an oversimplification, it's completely different to what she said. But it definitely sounds a lot better, doesn't it? Not to mention, it's essentially obscuring the original quote, presenting it as a semantic argument about biology, rather than actually talking about gender identity. We've all been there, really. Some drinks in and we forget we're arguing about biology or gender identity. Classic mistake, really. When someone presents a statement, like sex is real, there are questions that need to be asked. What is the context around it? How is it being represented? What's being implied? And what's the intent of the person presenting it? The thing is, sex is real is something already acknowledged as a fact by scientists, the broader LGBT community, as well as most of the trans community. However, there is an implication with it. When it isn't paired with gender identity is also real, it comes across as biological sex being the only type that matters. And given the context of the rest of the tweet that JK put out, this does feel like the intentional reading. But they don't really believe in trans identities, minimizing it to dress however you please or call yourself whatever you like, which completely overlooks what it means to be trans for a far more superficial statement. I promise there are video games in this video. 
somewhere. The reason I've spent so long covering this is because it's important to see why people were upset with the views JK was endorsing. She was a massive role model and had been a symbol of inclusivity. Bear in mind that this is the same person that had previously been embraced by the queer community. So for many people, trans people especially, who grew up with her stories, it was quite disheartening to see her making these comments. And there was widespread disappointment throughout the queer fanbase. This incident marked a major change in the way the media looked at JK Rowling. With many people condemning the comments she had made, there was also a small vocal minority that sent threats, but we'll talk about them in a little while. From this point onwards, we see JK doubling down on the views seen here. In June 2019, she put out another tweet mocking an article mentioning people who menstruate, with JK taking issue to them not saying women. The article did this because not all people who menstruate identify as women, and not all people who identify as women menstruate. It's inclusive language, not an attempt to erase women. This led to a thread where she talks again about sex being real. But similarly to the tweet with Maya, the tweet and the thread that follows talk specifically about Rowling's life being shaped as a cis woman. In the first tweet, it was a bit more subtle, but here there is definitely an underlying message about Rowling's identity as a woman. Again, not going to talk about it just yet, but it's good to keep in mind. And then, in 2020, the world was supposed to end, but it didn't for some reason, and we've been living in a hellish wilderness ever since. It also marked the release of a post J.K. Rowling made talking about sex and gender. From the start, the way J.K. speaks about people who have disagreed with her is, um, interesting. Her language is somewhat mocking when she describes a like being deemed evidence of wrong think, or accidentally compounding her like crime. In J.K.'s post, she again talks about receiving death threats and vile comments. Now, I've held off on saying this for long enough, but death threats and harassment are never okay, and the people sending JK Rowling those messages are completely in the wrong. It's also worth noting that while it might be a small minority sending harassment, there is still a large number of people, and it would be difficult for anyone to ignore. With that being said, throughout her statement, JK Rowling refers to these people as trans activists, portraying them as being the same as actual trans right advocates. Again, Death threats are never okay, but painting an entire group of people by the actions of that small vocal minority is not only incredibly inaccurate, it's actively damaging and creates a straw man to use. Instead of listening to actual trans right advocates, you just pull apart the construct instead. Look. It implies that every trans activist is irrational or someone who would send death threats. All opposition is labeled as trans activism not distinguishing between the majority of people who are genuinely hurt by what she said and the people she talks about sending accusations and threats. It's hard to say if this was intentional or subconscious, but by using it as a label for all of her dissenters, it dismisses valid concerns that people have and punches down to a group of people who don't have the reach or influence of someone as prominent as JK to properly represent themselves. And given JK heavily controls the conversation on places like Twitter, holding the larger megaphone, it becomes very difficult for those people to make their voices heard. I promise there are going to be video games soon. I'm not going to go into detail about JK's post. If you want a more in-depth analysis on her statement, there's a brilliant video by Jamie Dodger dedicated to covering it point by point, so I'll link it down below for people who are interested, along with JK Rowling's statement if you want to read that. Her statement focuses on cis women, terrified by trans activism, and it again goes back to what I mentioned earlier. Trans men are not really a focus of her article. She does mention them, but the focus is very much on trans women and the concerns JK Rowling has as a cis woman. So behind the mocking tone towards her dissenters that runs throughout the post, or the figures that are rather misleading in the way they're presented, behind the words written, what is actually driving it? This is a bit of a speculation on my part, but there seems to be two main reasons for JK Rowling's reaction here. I mean, she lists five in her statement, but they don't really seem to be the core of the problem on display. I mean, it's all well and good listening freedom of speech. I like that too, but I wouldn't exactly tie it directly to fears of trans activism. So moving past ataraxia philosophy and metaphysical skepticism, the first problem seems to be about female erasure. The idea that the trans movement, trans women in particular, are eroding women as a political and biological class and offering cover to predators like few before it. So that's her first reason. She believes that trans activism will lead to a regression in women's rights. The other reason seems to be a fear of trans women. There isn't a recognition of their identity as women, instead referring to them as men wearing costumes, and as she said earlier, offering cover to predators. 
I'm not going to cover it here, but JK Rowling's personal experiences with an abusive former relationship likely played into her fears of men. It's going without saying that while this is likely the rather understandable source of her mistrust in men, it doesn't justify a mistrust of all trans people as a result. I should also say that a study conducted in 2019 found that the claim that trans women in women's spaces would lead to an increase of predators was completely false, finding that there was no evidence to support this. I'll link to the study down below. Trans activism isn't about female erasure or trying to undermine feminism. They're campaigning for their own rights and face very real hostility simply for being trans. JK has also been relatively careful when speaking out about her own views, with an article from Politico observing that she tends to use proxies to put her views forward, either using people like Maya as the figurehead or citing the work of other gender critical thinkers. And speaking very briefly about the people JK surrounds herself with, they're um, an interesting group of people to say the least. Bit of a tangent here but bear with me. This is Posey Parker, a bit of a controversial figure even among trans exclusionists. And while she isn't tied directly to JK, they do share a few of the same friends. Posey is behind the Let Women Speak rallies, a rally for trans exclusionists. Now, on the 18th of September 2022, she had a couple of speakers, including Helen Joyce, pictured with Rowling here, and Maya Forstetter, also pictured with JK here. And here they are being filmed giving talks at the rally. Nothing we wouldn't already expect here, just showcase- Wait a minute. Who uploaded the videos of them talking? Uh, wait, a, a far right group promoted by Tommy Robinson? Oh! Oh no! Posey Parker wasn't just looking for support from self-confessed gender criticals, but anyone who would support anti-trans activism, which has allowed far-right groups like Hearts of Oak, Tree Huggers United was taken, to slowly use the gender critical rallies for their own purposes. Tangent within a tangent for a moment, it is also worth noting that JK Rowling did tweet about the rally, interestingly condemning the pro-trans protesters rather than the far-right groups in attendance. There is more to this story, but I'm trying my best to talk about video games eventually, so I'll link to an overview down below for people interested. Just wanted to point out Rowling's interaction with Posey's event. Now back to the first tangent. Posey has also been involved with groups like the Hands Across the Isle Coalition, a group aiming to connect anti-trans radical feminists with conservative Christian anti-LGBT groups, even calling for people to put aside issues like abortion rights to ally against trans rights. While not every trans exclusionist has been receptive to the far right, some, like Maya and Helen, have been perfectly happy to give speeches supported by far-right groups, with Maya even speaking at events partnered with the ADF, another group aiming to limit abortion rights, as well as being openly homophobic. If you remember back to half an aeon ago when I said I'd be talking about video games soon, <clears throat> I mentioned that one of the fears JK had was the erosion of women and women's rights. Would it shock you to learn that far-right groups are misogynistic and against women's rights? The fear cited by most women in particular involved with the gender-critical movement is that they're afraid of women losing their rights. The fear that trans people would somehow erase cis women. And for some of these people, the solution in their eyes seems to be to reach out to the far-right who are attempting to do exactly that. The fact that Posey had to call on gender criticals to look past the fact the right was trying to erase abortion rights and women's bodily autonomy speaks volumes. They are pointing at trans people, screaming that these are the people coming to take away their rights while walking side by side with people who are already successfully eroding women's liberties. Now with that being said, I'm not saying that JK is a supporter of Posey. I don't know that for certain. I do know that they keep a lot of the same company, and at the very least JK is somewhat aware of the Let Women Speak rallies, having tweeted about it and with Maya and Helen both giving talks, but I can't prove any real interaction or endorsement from Rowling. On an unrelated note, here's JK wearing a top criticizing Nicola Sturgeon, something that you can buy from Posey Parker's online store. Hashtag not sponsored. JK Rowling has had an evolution, going from a champion of inclusivity to someone Republicans quote when denying LGBTQ protections. I say it in the words of J.K. Rowling this past week, where she wrote, All I'm asking, all I want, is for similar empathy, similar understanding to be extended to the many millions of women whose sole crime is wanting their concerns to be heard without receiving threats or abuse. Damn it, Jim. James Langford there uses JK's own words 
opposing the Equality Act that would have helped to protect not just trans but all LGBTQ people. A woman who once proclaimed her hatred of bigotry is now having her words used by people like Jim to help enforce it. If you look at Rowling's Twitter account in 2023, transphobia is seemingly the only thing she talks about. She posts stuff like this fairly regularly, and apparently the irony of someone with a massive platform complaining about censorship is slightly lost on her. Final thing for this section I promise, but I've talked a lot about the people involved in the gender critical movement, and not much about the trans people that their words are hurting. The hatred of gender critical groups has been used to justify restrictions of rights that not only harm trans people, but also fuel others to harass trans people as well, and reinforces negative stereotypes that can be incredibly damaging to trans individuals. Attitudes towards the trans community are far more negative and hostile than towards LGB cis people. A study conducted by Stonewall in 2017 found that two out of five trans people experienced a hate crime because of their gender identity, and 41% of trans people have thought about taking their own life. This is made even worse when you realise that when transgender and non-binary youth have at least one adult who accepts them, the probability that they'd attempt suicide decreases by over 30%. With even just one person accepting them for who they are, it could be the difference between life and death. In 2023, I think it's easy to look at how far we've come as a society and forget that there is still a lot more that we need to do to protect these people being discriminated against. To tie this back to where we began, trans people are a group that are constantly fighting for their right to exist and face very real violence at a far higher rate than the rest of the LGBT community. So when you have someone as large and influential as JK Rowling coming along and essentially denying your right to exist, denying your identity, that can be incredibly harmful. I'll say again, sending hate and death threats to someone is never okay. But there are also people who don't have the audience or defenders of JK who are not only being harassed but also face very real danger for no other reason than the fact they are trans. Our words have power, and when you have a platform like JK's, they can travel a very long way. Harry Potter was a book series that had a message of inclusivity and acceptance. But when Hogwarts Legacy was announced, JK Rowling's politics overshadowed the message of the world she had built. She wasn't writing for the game, in fact, she was barely involved with it at all. But for many people, there was still a concern that Rowling would be making money off of the game through royalties. And this is where we have been heading. Given the people affected by JK's actions, given the groups connected to her friends, there was a controversy in the making, and a boycott was on the horizon. So, to give a rather brief recap, JK Rowling came out with a bunch of rather questionable views and it led to her being widely labelled as transphobic. She has friends that have attended rallies with far-right groups like Hearts of Oak and who are happy to work alongside conservative groups like the ADF, a group that wants to limit women's rights to abortions as well as LGBTQ rights. This is a condensed version by the way, there is a lot more out there, but I'm just giving a brief rundown so we can talk about the wizard game. It would be a bit of an understatement to say that JK has become a controversial character in recent years, and for a lot of people it has led to the need to separate her from the magical universe she created. Before going further, I want to say that I'm not here to pass judgement on either the people enjoying the game or the boycotters, and even me betraying it as just two groups is unfair. There are so many people on both sides it would be a massive oversimplification to just label them all under two binaries. So, I'm going to critique actions from different people, but please bear in mind those criticisms aren't being levied against everyone in that group. There's a group called Just Stop Oil in the UK. This is related, I swear. Just Stop Oil are an environmental activist group that got into quite a bit of controversy through actions like throwing soup at a Van Gogh art piece, which naturally led to a lot of people to ask, why would you waste soup on activism? That's a waste of good soup. Nobody needs soup more than me. The reason I mention them though is they're a good example of people trying to get publicity to spread awareness of a fairly important message, but the means to get there end up picking up more traction than the message they were trying to promote. In some cases, it even led to people becoming less sympathetic to climate change causes as a direct result of Just Stop Oil. To view them in a generous light, they're an example of people with good intentions who have alienated the people they were trying to reach. Keeping that in mind for Hogwarts Legacy, 
They were a mix of different voices, a lot of which had good intentions, but the way those intentions ended up being voiced were actively harmful to their goal. The purpose of a boycott is usually an attempt to reduce the number of sales of a product or company to protest something. In this case, the thing people are protesting is the fact that JK Rowling will be making money off of the game, and that money could potentially go towards anti-trans groups. By the way, my language seems a bit, uh, diplomatic at times. It's just to ensure I'm not catching any stray lawsuits. On that cheery note, lots of people were publicly calling for a boycott of Hogwarts Legacy. And if you accept the reasoning that people believe the money JK makes could be going towards transphobic groups, then I think a boycott is quite a reasonable stance to hold. But, like Just Stop Oil, it really comes down to how you deliver the message. And across the internet, it can be very difficult to act as a united front. There were some people who brought attention to JK as a reason to boycott, expressed their feelings on the franchise, and left it at that making people aware of what was going on, why they were boycotting, and leaving people with that information. A perfectly valid way of boycotting and spreading awareness of the situation. But a lot of the more controversial takes that gained traction seemed more like ultimatums. Now, this goes without saying, but please don't send hate towards any of the people I'm talking about here. This video in particular got a lot of coverage, and some quite mixed reactions. Please do not support the upcoming Hogwarts Legacy game. I'm asking you very sincerely, please do not stream it. Don't make YouTube videos about it. Don't buy it. Don't bloody pre-order it. Um, the reason being is that you may not be aware that by supporting this title, you are essentially aligning yourself with some really heinous transphobic values. The problem with this clip as an appeal is that Will isn't just bringing attention to JK Rowling with his call for a boycott. He's also stating that by supporting it, you're aligning with transphobic views. Ultimatums are not a good way of winning support, because to someone who isn't fully clued in, it can feel like a threat. I don't think this was the intention of the video at all, but it can very quickly change the argument into supporting the game makes you a transphobe, and then people who were on the fence feel like they're being attacked and get pushed away because of it. Now, I don't think that buying a video game makes you transphobic. Unless it's called Transphobia the Video Game, in which case I might have a few questions. But if you saw that video getting retweeted, that might be the impression you'd get from it. It has to be said that this was one of the more moderate takes. But there's also the issue of how people will use and interpret your words afterwards. And when issuing an ultimatum, it's very easy for other people to twist your words and portray everyone supporting a boycott as irrational. I'll talk a bit more about that later though. So far, I've been covering some of the more moderate groups boycotting the game. Even if you may not agree with their stances, they're being reasonable with their expression of support for a boycott. But now I'm going to take a look at some of the more bad faith boycotters. Around the time the game launched, a site was gaining traction by the name of Have They Streamed That Wizarding Game, a site that monitored Twitch streamers who were playing Hogwarts Legacy. The purpose stated for this was to allow someone to unfollow creators who were playing the game. But, to be a bit more cynical, it was also a perfect site to harass streamers playing the game. I said this when talking about JK Rowling, so I'll say it again here. Death threats and harassment are never okay. If someone thinks they have the moral high ground by harassing people for playing a video game, then they should be very aware of their own shaky footing, because you lose any moral authority you might have had the second you use it as an excuse or permission to harass someone else. I have seen people talking about this game and the people thinking of playing it as if they actually were Voldemort, cutting off anyone who even slightly questions their position, at a time when there are some very real-world problems that we need to deal with. In the UK, during one of the 400 Conservative leadership races that took place last year, it was practically a contest to see who could be the most transphobic, to appeal to their voting base. And even more recently, they were blocking gender recognition laws in Scotland. It is a very scary time to be a trans person. And while there is absolutely a legitimate conversation to have over products related to JK Rowling, there also needs to be a bit of perspective. You may not know this, but this year we've seen the biggest onslaught against LGBTQ people yet, with over 350 anti-trans bills being introduced in at least 36 states as of last month. That's double what we saw last year, and we're only a couple of months in. We've seen streamers like Hassan Piker, who had planned to fundraise for the Trevor Project, while playing Hogwarts, choosing not to because of the backlash and potential harassment. Only reason why I, I'm not playing this game, and I know a bunch of other people are not playing this game, is because we know that it's not worth it to get bullied endlessly and called transphobic endlessly in, in, in when we have 
massive uh, queer communities and audiences. That's it. Everybody f knows how much leftist mother love to chirp on the internet. They got no power. All they do is chirp, chirp, chirp. And that's precisely why so many f people that would otherwise like play it, maybe even raise money for, uh, you know, charities or whatever. Um, you know, they're, they're not doing it. I also saw this comment here. I've seen a lot of similar comments and they really do confuse me. Hassan points out that by making it not worth it and viewing that as a success, it also means less money for fundraisers coming out of it. An opportunity to raise awareness and money for a trans charity has been lost. And without replacing it with anything, there are some people who seem to be viewing this as a success. Important to remember again, these individuals aren't representative of every boycotter. And you could argue that Hassan could have done the fundraiser with a different game, which is a very legitimate point. But to add speculation on my part, I would guess the appeal of Hogwarts would have been attracting a larger audience than what Hassan would normally reach, given he's a small fledgling streamer and all. Also, in the end, Hassan ended up fundraising for the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, which came a couple days after, stating in a tweet that he'd do other fundraisers down the line. I also want to look at the Girlfriend Review situation quickly. Girlfriend Reviews is... It's a comedy show about video games. Well, the name is a bit of a giveaway. They received a massive amount of mainstream attention, with headlines covering harsh harassment they received, leading to one of the hosts allegedly crying on stream. As it turns out, this version of events was inaccurate, something pointed out by Girlfriend Reviews themselves. First, I didn't cry, I just got a little verklempt. And even if I was brought to tears, how is that news? I cry every day. Second, not all of what happened that morning on Twitch was bullying. There were a lot of hateful messages deleted by our mod team, but it's Twitch chat, so we're kind of used to that. Many viewers were simply voicing their disappointment. Disappointment based on the fact that buying Hogwarts Legacy puts money in the pocket of JK Rowling, a woman who funds anti-LGBTQ political activity. According to them, most people were simply stating their beliefs and why they didn't support the game, but there was still a group of people accusing them of transphobia, while they were actively raising money for the Trevor Project. Also, some of the comments were Rather odd, to say the least. In their video about Hogwarts Legacy, Shelby directly points to have they streamed that wizard game as a source of people coming to harass her and Matt. They were also targeted on Reddit, with both of their accounts having been permanently suspended at the time I'm writing this. Again, this was while they were actively fundraising for a trans charity. It's as if virtue signaling is more important to the people sending these messages than actually helping people. I don't really know what the people harassing other people or trying to spoil the ending are trying to achieve. The Act Man created a video recently focusing on this group in particular, and their logic at times seems to be, uh, questionable. The Act Man points out that for some of these people, it doesn't seem to be about finding a solution or helping trans charities. They're focusing on the streamer or media figure, while also looking past anything they have done to help the cause that they're lambasting them for in the first place. After I donated 2000 to that hotline on stream and encouraged others to do so, one final point. What do you think r slash gaming circle jerk's reaction to that was? Take a wild guess. Come on now, lads. Act man is still the no politics in my video guy. A KKK member could come on here and say trans rights and white trans people will just go redemption arc. Yes. Um, they compared me to a KKK member. That's what they did. And if you go into the comments on this Reddit post, Nobody is talking about donating to charity or raising money. Before moving on, I really want to say that the actions of the people harassing streamers are not representative of everyone boycotting the game. They are unfortunately a very vocal minority and their actions are not only damaging, but make everyone boycotting look irrational by association. This has also been amplified by the way the media has been covering Hogwarts Legacy. I already talked about girlfriend reviews, but the number of articles covering this one channel, experiencing mean comments on Twitch, it doesn't make it right, but when I word it as Twitch streamer receives mean messages from chat, it could be any Twitch channel having to take a break for a moment. To be clear though, while there might be a couple of right-wing outlets covering these stories to villainize trans activists, for most outlets, Hogwarts Legacy and its controversy make for highly viewed stories, so they keep on writing them. This presents a couple of problems though, as you hear a lot of stories about streamers like Girlfriend Reviews getting harassed and because it's being written in articles, suddenly it feels like the situation was a lot worse than it actually was. 
The other issue is that you end up villainizing trans activists along with the Twitter mob. People aren't going to distinguish between the two. Most people won't even read past the headline. It might not be malicious on the part of those outlets, but the end result to the reader is that all boycotters are deeply irrational and resort to harassment, magnifying the actions of a few and betraying them as representatives for every person boycotting the game. There is a rather large problem when it comes to boycotting. Especially when it is so public and disjointed, you risk having the opposite effect entirely, giving it a bunch of free advertising instead. It's debatable how much free publicity a Harry Potter game would have needed in the first place, but it's something we see a lot with boycotts. Hogwarts Legacy ended up being one of the best-selling games on Steam, with the boycott proving to be fairly ineffective. Boycotts on a large scale typically don't work. If you look at Nike a few years ago, when they faced a boycott from Trump supporters, their sales increased over that period. A boycott can act as free advertisement for a company, and oftentimes you will get people drawn to something based on the fact people they disagree with are against it. For a large portion of people, there was a Harry Potter video game and people wanted to play it. Unless they were online and had been actively following the discourse around the game, they might not have even realized there was a controversy or even have an opinion on J.K. Rowling, other than they liked her books. And also, what was the deal with the time travel in the third one? Wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. There were also groups that seemed to care about the game specifically because of the efforts to boycott. Now, I've already talked about how there were many different approaches to boycotting, depending on the corner of the internet you found yourself in. And in some corners, you had people who were supporting the game despite boycotters. Going online, you can find lots of comments along the lines of I wasn't going to buy the game, but now I am, or now I'm going to buy two copies. For some people, these kind of comments were in response to the rhetoric of people harassing others for wanting to play Hogwarts Legacy, essentially pushing back on what they perceive to be boycotters collectively harassing people who wanted to play the game, with sites like Have They Streamed That Wizard Game getting a lot of attention for this reason. And for those people, I can understand where that logic is coming from. However, there were also people who were genuinely transphobic, using this situation to betray all of the boycotters by their vocal minority. Hogwarts Legacy had inadvertently become a battleground, turning the game into a culture war. From that point onwards, when Hogwarts Legacy succeeded, as massive AAA games tend to do, spoilers I know, the story being reported wouldn't be massive video game sells well, it would be boycott over trans rights fails, which is exactly what we ended up seeing. And there will be groups that will be applauding the game's success because they see it as a win against trans rights. Again, this is not every person posting about the game on Twitter, but just like we see with any boycott, when you have one group vehemently opposed to something, you will find another group more than willing to support it. Through the tumultuous relationship the internet has had with JK Rowling, to the backlash that followed Hogwarts Legacy as a result, there's been one group of people keeping quiet while everyone else is having a Twitter battle royale. The last survivor of the Great Twitter War gets a Tesla signed by Elon and a Cherry Bakewell. The Harry Potter trademark is currently jointly owned by JK Rowling and Warner Bros. And given we've already talked about JK and her interesting choices and friends, it's time to look at the skeletons Warner Bros are hiding. We're also going to touch on Avalanche Software, who made this. Not to be confused with Avalanche Studios, who made this. It's difficult to know if Warner Bros. had any idea about the backlash that was coming for the game. Fantastic Beasts franchise had suffered at the box office, but mostly due to a lack of interest and poor writing, not from an effort to boycott them. And other reports show that Rowling's book sales increased during the pandemic, so there doesn't seem to have been a boycott for these products, despite having a far more direct tie to Rowling. So when Warner announced a video game, I really doubt they would have anticipated the backlash received. That being said, I doubt they were complaining with the backlash they received either. There's a saying often used in politics that there's no such thing as bad publicity. So when Warner Bros. put their foot in the hornet's nest, the screams were probably ecstatic. By the way, this is not an endorsement to try and copy this behavior, as some hornets are very angry and mean, and should probably be left alone. Hashtag not all hornets. The media coverage of the controversy of Hogwarts Legacy was non-stop and it made it a very difficult game to avoid. While this was going on, Avalanche Software was the team under Porky Games actually building the game, 
versus that had its own set of twists and turns. The first of which started in November 2022. The hype for the game had begun, and Avalanche had a 40 minute gameplay showcase, revealing a more expansive look at the world than what had been shown before. I remember watching the stream with curiosity. I was interested about if they were going to mention anything about the controversy, or just strictly focus on the gameplay. And while they didn't cover the controversy, choosing to focus on the gameplay instead, they did make a note during character creation about being able to choose masculine or feminine voices, as well as a witch or wizard regardless of body type. A quiet statement by the studio that seemed to affirm their support for trans rights and trans players. It wasn't a major note, just something that was mentioned before they moved on to talking about something else, but I didn't see many outlets talking about this when the gameplay was released, which was surprising given it seemed to be quite a clear message in support of trans rights on the part of Avalanche Software. Now, if you want to look at this cynically, then it could be seen as an insincere move to direct the conversation away from JK Rowling. But with so many people playing the game, I think even if we assume this to be true, it's adding some diversity as a result. Some people may feel more welcome than they would have before. So regardless of Avalanche or Warner Bros's intentions, it's still a net positive in my view. The thing that gained a lot more attention though, occurred shortly before the game was released, with the inclusion of the first trans character in Harry Potter. This was a fairly controversial addition, even within LGBT groups, a lot of people pointing out the name of the character, Serona Ryan, a trans woman for sounding like Sir Ryan. I mean, there are definitely a lot of names out there and they really did choose Ryan out of all of them, which is something. People push back on this, saying the name was traditionally Celtic, like a lot of the names JK had sourced from the novels. This was then met with further backlash as people were claiming that Serona was a fertility goddess and that this was actually intended to mock the character. For the record, I looked into this and Serona is a healing goddess, associated with healing springs in particular. I couldn't find anything linking her to fertility directly. She's sometimes seen with eggs and snakes, which could indicate a cycle of life, but that's all I could find. I'm betting the devs just used a Celtic name spinner and called it a day, really. Honestly, you try and look at a video game and the next minute you're ranting about Celtic deities. Could happen to anyone, to be fair. Putting the naming aside for a moment, though, it wasn't the only issue a lot of people had with it, with LGBTQ activists stating that the move felt insincere, and journalists describing it as performative. Stephanie Sterling tweeted that a member of the team had allegedly added the character as a way of pivoting the conversation away from JK Rowling. When dealing with a massive company, whether they speak on behalf of Avalanche or Portkey Games, they're still the mouthpiece of Warner Bros, a major corporation which doesn't care either way. If supporting trans rights gains them more sales, then they will be staunch advocates. If they can make money off of a controversy, they're not going to object and they are equally happy to take the money of every person looking at the people boycotting, saying that they'll buy two copies, because their money spends the same two Warner Bros. Companies don't have a core set of beliefs at the end of the day. Well, I suppose they have one. Make as much money as possible, and they are perfectly happy to play both sides to maximize their profit. Something to remember with any product, but especially this one. If you are buying a video game just to spite people, Regardless of what your reasons might be, just remember that the only group really benefiting is the major corporation, and profit speaks louder than ethics. So this was supposed to be a short video, but now we have this. So, you're welcome. I swear, my next video won't be controversial, it'll be comparing Daleks or something. But now, I'm going to wrap up with my personal thoughts on Hogwarts Legacy and this mess of a video essay. Some loose ends I want to address before I finish. A lot of people will say they want to buy the game to support the developers, but as I said in the previous section, you're only actively helping one group by buying the game, and that's the mega corporation behind the talented people actually making the product. The people making the game got paid before the game even came out. They aren't going to see your money. As Stephanie Sterling pointed out in one of their recent videos, a company doing well is more likely to lay off employees than reward them. I wonder which company laid up- It was most of them. The other argument I want to address is the argument that, yes, this money might be going to transphobic groups, but our phones were made using child labor. The chocolate we eat likely had ties to slavery, so we can't complain. Let me be clear. Firstly, this isn't an argument. It's a false equivalency. But secondly, the ultimate conclusion to that line of thinking 
To follow their logic for a second is that we shouldn't do anything to help anyone. It's true. You can't be aware of every bit of exploitation, every bit of prejudice or bigotry that goes into making something, into making anything. But I don't think that should mean we don't try at all. Boycotts typically don't work. They might work on a smaller local level, but typically for something as big as a video game, it wasn't going to work. The problem occurred when it moved past just a boycott. People were tying their values to it, and this led to the success of the boycott being publicly tied to support for the trans movement. So when the game succeeded, like it was always going to, the story around the game looks like a rejection of the trans community instead. I've already covered most of the different groups in this video. I've looked at JK Rowling, her friends, their friends, the boycotters, and Warner Bros. So now I want to leave you with my perspective. If you've watched some of my previous videos, you might have noticed that I very subtly point at Activision and Ubisoft a lot for their misconduct. And for the past couple of years, I haven't been buying games from those companies. Is that going to be a massive gut punch to a company like Ubisoft? No, but at the same time, I don't want to support a company that was drawing attention away from their sexual misconduct allegations with game announcements. That's the line in the sand that I have drawn for myself. The reason I mention this is because when I say that I didn't buy Hogwarts Legacy because of the money going to JK Rowling, I'm not saying it because it's this game. If the game hadn't had a public boycott, I probably would have landed on the decision I made regardless. Now again, this is my personal philosophy, and I'm not here to condemn people who don't follow the rules that I choose to place on myself. I'm not here to judge people for playing a video game. But if you have watched this, you find what I've said interesting, and are interested in playing Hogwarts Legacy, then I'll leave people with a few workarounds. If I wanted to play Ubisoft's upcoming Star Wars generic open world simulator, or even Hogwarts Legacy at some point, then the problem isn't playing the game. It's buying it from a company whose values don't align with mine. So for me, the solution is, oh, what's this pirate ship doing here? But seriously, for me, the solution is to use secondhand shops. If you go in a couple of days after the game has come out, there will be a bunch of copies from people who play through the campaign and then sell it as soon as they're finished. It has the added benefit of supporting smaller businesses. And you can still play the game itself without the moral pondering. Yeah, I'm definitely doing a Dalek video after this. It's true. There is no ethical consumption under capitalism. We are all part of that system, and we have a limited impact in the ways we can affect it. But at the same time, I don't think that means that we should stop trying. It can be really depressing looking into anything we consume, but if we stop caring, if we continue giving these companies an inch, then they'll keep on taking a mile. Hey everyone, thank you for listening to this mad spiral into the storm around Hogwarts Legacy. I hope you've enjoyed it. This was a very difficult script to write, and I'm pretty burnt out after finishing it, but this has been a video I've wanted to make for a while. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, and maybe consider subscribing. If you are writing comments, please remember to be kind. This is a very charged topic, and while it might be an intellectual debate for some people, there are also trans people whose lives are being affected by what is happening in the world at the moment, so please be considerate of other people before commenting something. With that being said, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in a bit.